Hello, everyone, and welcome to another discussion with me. Um, today, I have uh, two guests here. The one has been here previously, who is uh, invoking theism. And uh, the next or the second uh, guest which we have here is uh, Josh Rasmussi. And uh, today's topic is going to be about the contingency, contingency argument. And uh, without a further ado, uh, present yourself, guys. You can start. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead. Um, how's it going, everybody? Um, I'm Tim, and uh, I run the channel called Invoking Theism. Basically, the whole scope of my channel is um is to basically kind of the area i'm i'm at and, and i work best with is with kind of the metaphysical things um and I'm, I'm a christian theist so my main videos are are in terms of uh evidences for theism and and, and kind of more metaphysical things rather than anything historical or evidential of that side and so it's, that's why i'm here today because this is one of my favorite arguments um currently working on uh, videos like my uh, first introduction to my evidence of theism series and then I want to do some critiques of some um, more popular higher level uh, kind of atheist figures such as Sean Carroll and kind of his beliefs about uh, reality and the nature of the universe and whatnot and I think I have a, a pretty good argument um, that uh, presses back on some of the certain things that he thinks and so that's that's one thing that's on the way along with uh, my evidence for theism series and so I'll just keep it there, but um, I'm here pretty much today just to kind of want to learn and also with the knowledge that I've already have kind of give my input and, and see where we can we can go and we can run with that. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And uh, probably I as well want to learn something new, even though I, I know something about this topic as well. But uh, yeah, so Josh introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Josh Rasmussen. I teach philosophy at Azusa Pacific University. And one of my core purposes and passions is to help people to build out their worldview using reason, using evidence. And I'm also deeply interested in kind of helping to depolarize some of these cultural debates. Um, atheists and theists is, is an example where I feel like a lot of people are sort of talking past each other there's a kind of enemy mentality. And I really want to empower people and help people to see reasons that can be relevant to them. So I think sometimes in these debates, it's kind of like one side is trying to get another side to see truths, these golden truths, but not every truth is relevant to every person at every time. And so I'm interested in helping people to have a little more power to discover the truths that really matter to them and empower their life. So that's what I'm about. And, you know, we're going to talk about the contingency argument. And I think of this as an argument that's like a tool to help people to sort of investigate things from their own perspective to expose uh, the nature of reality. And, you know, whether they think the argument works or not, it's kind of an invitation to look deeper into things. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Josh, for introducing yourself and as well team thank you so um should we just start uh to discuss about the the uh, argument which you have presented josh or do you would you like to go uh, different questions first so it might be good to just summarize the argument and then just let people raise the questions and we can kind of interact with the questions. Does that sound like a good plan to you? Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. So, um, yeah. Uh, so without the further ado, uh, I think some people already know your basic ideas because you recently just published the uh, book, How Reason Can Lead to God. And so, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Tell about, tell us about something, you know, 
of that. Yeah, sure, sure. So, I mean, we were talking kind of before we started about how there are different versions of the argument and there's kind of a cluster of arguments and a cluster of concepts. And so, I mean, I don't necessarily know if it's the most helpful to focus on one version as much as to kind of give a picturesque summary of kind of the whole strategy of the argument. So what I was saying before was that that kind of the point of the argument as I see it is to expose a reason, one reason to think that there's a fundamental reality that has a kind of necessary existence, which provides, you might think of this as providing an explanation of the difference between the things that have a further explanation and the foundation of things, which doesn't have any further explanation because it's the foundation. And the explanation of this difference, or at least one aspect of the explanation, is that the, uh, the foundational thing is necessary, has a necessary existence, got this firm grip on existence, and so there's nothing that could sort of exist uh, without it to produce it, because it just sort of like already of necessity exists. Whereas everything else has a contingent existence, and so, you know, we talked about how science looks for inferences to the best explanation of, of things, looks for causes that explain our observations. And so a nice little general principle is that the best explanation is going to be more likely than no explanation, other things being equal. And so you apply that principle to the contingent reality, the reality that doesn't have this necess necessity built into it. The best explanation of it is going to be better than no explanation. But the best explanation of it is going to ultimately have to be a non-circular explanation to explain why there is this contingent totality. And so to avoid circularity, we have this metaphysically necessary foundation. So that's kind of like a picture summary. You can think of contingent reality as kind of like this one blob, and then the necessary foundation is like another blob, <laughs> you know, leaving open sort of what it is in addition to its metaphysical necessity that provides a kind of anchor or explanation of the contingent realities that there are. And then from this picturesque summary, there's different ways of getting more precise. And maybe we can even leave that precision to um, the kind of questions that people ask. Unless Tim wants to add something to that. Yeah, yeah, feel um, free. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a very, very concise um, uh, way to put it. Um, the only thing I would really say is I, th I feel like a lot of people um, who are less familiar with kind of how this argument works is, you know, under the umbrella of, of cosmological arguments, usually people are familiar with things that have to do with uh, causal principles rather than uh, rely on explanatory principles. And uh, like we were talking about before the, um, before this started, um, if you go, you know, historically look at Leibniz, you know, he was more concerned with a sufficient reason and explanation rather than a first cause of something as, as if like the clump, the scope of like something like the clump would be. Um, but uh, if we follow our, if we start with an explanatory principle, you know, um, then if we apply that to, to what a reality that we're looking at, you know, give its contingent reality, then we follow that through and through, then we kind of get to what you were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, there is an independent nature of something, something that's self-existent, something that anchors it, um, really the foundation of these things. And so that's why um, I think there's a, that's a crucial distinction that um, I think f people who are less familiar should understand, um, which is uh, more of the explanatory nature of it rather than a first cause or causal link or chain or something that has to hinge on something that's finite versus infinity and things like that. It's just easy to just kind of get the ground layer going and then and, and start with kind of those basic things that proceed forth from that. Yeah, I just want to really echo that. That's really, really important because people will sometimes think of this sort of Kalam cosmological argument when they hear cosmological argument, which is an argument from beginnings. And so you start looking at for a beginning of things, a beginning of the universe, and you're looking for a first cause, as you were saying, um, whereas this argument from contingency leaves open the number of causes. So even if the causal chain is infinite, uh, you know, if there's an infinite, imagine there was an infinite chain of blue dominoes, one knocking over the, the other. You can still ask what explains the existence of that infinite chain. Why, why are they blue? You know, why are they all blue? You know, uh, you know, it, it, there's that joke that you can explain the earth in terms of a turtle and then you explain that turtle in terms of another turtle and it's just turtles all the way down. Well, it's kind of 
funny to the mind because you understand that that's not going to be a complete and adequate explanation. It doesn't explain why there's even an infinite stack of turtles. That's, that's a really important. I'm glad you brought this up here because I think that a lot of people think that arguments from cause and effect have to first show that there is a first cause or that there's not an infinite regress. And, um, and that, that's not true for every such argument. This argument from contingency leaves open. Uh, you know, even if there's an infinite number of contingent things, there's still going to be a call for a deeper explanation of the contingent reality. Just like if there were an infinite number of blue dominoes or green dominoes, it's like, okay, but why are there any <laughs> at all? You know, uh, merely, Richard Taylor says this, he's just like, merely citing the age of a thing doesn't explain why that thing exists at all. And I would just add, like, near, merely citing the number of contingent things doesn't explain why there are contingent things at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's interesting, you know, when you think different versions of uh, cosmological arguments, but, you know, it's, it's really important to acknowledge that the uh, contingency argument is not, you know, especially just the beginning of things, but it's, you know, uh, discussing about the uh, necessity of, uh, of a being and the cause in itself, you know, what, what is the explanation of that cause, you know, I would say, like the late Nietzschean argument, it focuses on the, uh, you know, it starts with this principle of sufficient reason. And, you know, it's, it's really important. As you mentioned just early, uh, you know, there are uh, different uh, versions of this principle of sufficient reason. But for example, uh, you know, philosophers like Alexander, Alexander Pross, you know, they uh, present this uh, principle as, of sufficient reason as, you know, Leibniz would uh, present it and it, it it pretty much says that everything you know that exists has an explanation of its ex existence either by necessity of its own nature or something external cause so you know it's really you know whether or not there is an infinite uh, regress of uh, things still you know you have to have some sort of a uh, ground of of the existence of those causes well personally i think there is some problems with the infinite regress idea if you, if you try to explain the foundation of reality like the first cause i i think you have to have some sort of a first cause or a more fundamental you know being behind all the causes which you know aristotelian proof goes through you know why there has to be this unactualized actualizer but anyways um yeah and it can also help here just to distinguish between kind of different notions of cause so some philosophers will even say that maybe there's an infinite causal history and no first cause but there's sort of another axis which we might call dependence or if we widen our notion of cause, maybe we could call it a cause in, a, in another sense. Uh, but sometimes philosophers will just call it grounds. And so you can have a necessary ultimate ground of the infinite chain of causes, even if there are other independent problems with an infinite chain of causes. Um, but just the point is, is that we can put those to the side here and just recognize that we need some sort of further explanation of the contingent things. And, and so you mentioned Alex Proust might be worth um, just giving one kind of more precise version of the argument from contingency that Proust and I give in our book, Necessary Existence. So we actually give a variety of different arguments in that book. Um, one of the arguments that we give is just kind of a classic argument where our causal principle is that for any contingent things, there's going to be some causal explanation of those things. And, um, and so there you can see it doesn't matter the number of things. Um, it's, it's a general principle. And then we motivate this principle in several ways. One of them is just by universal experience. So, you know, this isn't an inference from parts to holes or anything like this. It's just an inference from universal experience. We never see cups that are contingent 
exist without any prior cause. Um, and, and that's true whether it's one cup or 10 cups. You know, it, the plural doesn't make a difference. The number doesn't make a difference. There's kind of actually a more general principle of irrelevant differences when you start thinking of causal principles. Because I think everybody recognizes that there's some causes of some things. Then the question is then, what would be a relevant difference between the cause and the uncaused? And so that's where you can have a principle that, well, here's a relevant difference, contingency. Contingent things call for further explanation to explain why it is rather than not. Whereas if it has necessary existence, then it doesn't have that kind of, uh, that need for a further explanation. Uh, because there is no question of why it is rather than not. It couldn't not be. So, yeah. So that those are some thoughts. I actually got to... Um, be right back in a second. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, um, Tim, is there any any thoughts you have on this? Um, no, I, I I really like the way that's put. Um, yeah, I think that um, uh, going off the whole distinction between um, the causal principles and explanatory principles, um, that uh, you know, you have kind of the the mainline kind of principle of sufficient reason, you know any positive fact has an explanation. Um, and, and, and applying, you, know, you, you can apply that, you know, every contingent fact has an explanation. Um, but there are some more uh, kind of modest versions or weaker versions of that, like uh, Josh was talking about, you know, um, if it's possible for something to have, you know, it's possible for something to have an explanation, it's possible for a contingent thing to have an explanation, you can work with that um, and things like that. Um, I always see, um, kind of from my observation is that um, kind of with certain certain explanatory principles we use, we kind of start with kind of a, a fundamental kind of base metaphysical starting line, which is like something exists, you know, like you pointed out earlier, Josh, it's like something exists and we can work from there, from there on. You know, if you can, if you concede that, you know, things that do not have to exist, but do have explanations for why they exist, then if we can agree on that, then we can work from there. And then we can then move forward and proceed onto how we analyze things. And then we can get to that distinction, final distinction between, well, there's two categories of things. There's contingently existing things and there's necessarily existing things. Um, I see in like in terms like of infinity, when people posit infinity as a, an explanation for why digit things exist, um, I, I think about in terms of, well, yeah, you know, it's like, what's the relevant difference between something that's an infinite amount, someone, something that's a finite amount? You know, do we have to have an infinite amount? Is there something special about when you get to infinity versus from something that is purely finite? You yeah. know, and how, how do we investigate that? Because um, it, it brings me to kind of um, uh, what are our stopping points? Um, I look at people like, uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier in my opening, um, you have people like, uh, Sean Carroll, Dr. Sean Carroll, who says, hey, you know, I'm perfectly fine with, um, with things like brute facts. Just, it is unexplained. It's here, but it has an expla explanation. You know, for people like him, you know, he has, he recognizes that certain principles work, but for him, his stopping point is, well, let's just end with unexplained. And if we're gonna look at kind of uh, theories, and uh, which is the best theory, which is most plausible for understanding, um, reality and its grounding in things. Um, I think that we should all opt in for something that is explained versus the unexplained, because I think that in our finite understanding and our purview, that if we come across something that looks unexplained, I think it would be something that either needs further investigation or it's just something that we ourselves are not in the position to investigating, because I, I feel like um, if our explanatory principles do work, when they are applied to contingent reality, then we are justified in, in staying consistent to that. If we find other phenomena in certain places, that seems like it has an unexplained nature to order or something. Does that, does that make sense where I'm going with that? Yeah, it, I think that, um, and this is one of those places where I do see a kind of a lot of talking past each other. And so I have this desire to kind of be a little bit of a peacemaker or translator because um, kind of one of the worries I think that people would have is that, well, everybody's going to have a stopping point somewhere. So everybody's going to have something that has no kind of further explanation, right? And so, you know, if you're going to say that God is your stopping point, well, now you've added categorical complexity to reality, 
uh, better to sort of shave off that complexity and have have just uniformity of contingent things where uh, all, everything's contingent, everything's non-God, right? And then instead, the unexplained is just, you know, something else, something more familiar, something more natural. Um, and and it, it, that's not inconsistent with what you're saying. It's just, I think sometimes somebody like Sean Carroll might feel like they're, they're not fully being understood because they're going to say, look, we all have the, start, the stopping point. And the question is like, why have one stopping point over another? Um, and so I think that's, that's a good, good point. And I, and I also think Sean Carroll is going to motivate thinking that contingent things are uncaused or unexplained in terms of what we find out from science. So what we have is the quantum mechanics, the study of the small things, and we have these virtual particles that seem to come into being. It's not that they're fully uncaused. It's just that there's no sufficient explanation of them coming into being then and there rather than uh, in another location or not coming into being. There's a kind of indeterminacy there. And, and I, I think those are actually just kind of helpful points to even clarify the strength of the argument from contingency and separate some things. And these won't be new things to you, Tim, but, um, but just to get these clear, clear points out here, uh, first of all, sufficient explanation can mean adequate explanation, doesn't have to mean necessity and uh, deterministic or necessary explanation. So you can have a kind of, you know, virtual particles come from prior states indeterministically. It doesn't have to be a deterministic explanation. And so it might be that there's a kind of equivocation on the word explanation that just has to get clarified. So we're not talking about a deterministic explanation. We're just talking about some explanation, whether it's deterministic or not. And then as far as everybody has um, a stopping point, I think that's right. In fact, that's actually a point of unity I think everybody can come to this place and then ask, okay, what is the best stopping point? And so we've kind of talked about why contingency, it looks like those are just the kinds of things that um, have a further explanation, can have a further explanation. I think it's helpful to just go by this principle in science, like explain things as far as you can, unless you have some explanation of why you can't explain things farther. And so, you know, if Sean Carroll has a reason to think that there's an initial contingent state or some contingent state that can't be further explained, then that's great. Then he can vote. He's explaining why it's unexplained. Uh, but in the absence of that further reason, the presumption is to have a further explanation. And that's where I think you can have a distinction between a necessary foundation versus a contingent foundation. A necessary foundation has a relevant difference from all the contingent things. It has this, necess this necessity built into it, which sort of explains why um, there's nothing that sort of gets behind it to produce it or to cause it to be, because it already of necessity exists, if it exists at all. So, and that's completely consistent with what you're just saying. And I just wanted to add some of those clarifying points because I've just seen so many of these conversations take place and people just talk past each other. And hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Um, it doesn't clarify everything, of course, but hopefully that does help clarify some things. What do you guys think? Yeah. Um, I, yes, I'm, I'm appreciative of that because I, I see that too. Um, and I think um, it's helpful. Yeah. We all do have our stopping points. Um, I think the thing that I usually think about is, okay, well, I hesitate to, since I believe that there, you know, that there is a necessary being, that there is a necessary foundation, um, that then because it's a because it's nature as necessity, then we don't need to call that thing brute. And I think um, many times when we look at stopping points and people say, well, you're just choosing your brute fact over a different brute fact. Mm -hmm. um, but where I see the difference in that is, is I'm not, I'm not opting in for, I'm opting in for a starting point, but I have a stopping point, but my stopping point doesn't necessitate that. Therefore, that means it's a brute fact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the explanation comes from, from, from necessity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like down the line, more uh, people who hold to a necessary foundation will opt in for it not being it's an explanation being not a brute fact by its necessity and those who don't will just opt in for brute facts um 
Does that make sense? Like, do you think that we shouldn't call, like, like we are justified in calling our stopping point not a brute fact? No, that, that, that's good. It also depends on what you mean by explanation here. So, you know, we can talk about causal explanations. And somebody might say, well, there's no, you know, there's some place where there's no causal explanation. We're sort of at the ultimate. But I, I like how you put that. I mean, there's still a sense in which we can explain it in terms of its necessity. Um, I sort of go back and forth on this. I'm kind of undecided about whether it's that the necessity explains it or whether it's the, necess the necessity explains why it doesn't need to have an explanation, if that makes sense. Like, so if you, you arrive at this ultimate necessary thing, you might say, well, why is it there rather than not? Well, because it has to be there. So that's where the necessity explains it. But another idea is that, well, because it has to be there, that's why there's no further explanation of its being there. And I kind of just go back and forth between mm -hmm. those two. I'm not really sure what to say, but I feel like no matter what you say, the important point is, is that having a necessary thing is relevantly different from having a brute contingent thing. You know, I mean, this is why philosophers who study this, I mean, I think about Graham Oppie, for example, he's a well-known uh, philosopher mm -hmm. in the field of philosophy of religion. And I mean, he makes this argument. He says we should eliminate brute contingency as far as we can. And he has an independent reason for thinking that a necessary foundation would anchor modality itself. And so he sort of leans towards that view as his best working hypothesis. And it's great because it does it. It removes brute contingency as far as you can, you know. Now, look, if you have a reason to think that there is some brute contingency, that might tip the scales in your own mind. And I want to actually kind of camp on this because I think this is an important point. I think it's helpful to think of this argument as a tool for your own personal exploration. So it could be that you have reasons to think that there is some contingent thing that couldn't be explained. I mean, I was talking with a philosopher one time who, who said that he thought that the necessary thing would have to be God. He had independent reasons to think that God didn't exist. And that was part of his reason for thinking that there's brute contingency. Okay. And I don't want to say that that's not a rational move. I mean, I think for him, that's actually useful because now he's, he's seeing kind of what's at stake and that he has a reason to um, think some contingency is brute. And then on the other hand, it could go the other way where like you don't have an independent reason to think that there isn't this necessary foundation. And so then by the uniformity of explanation, the presumption of explanation, that will give you a reason to think that there is a necessary foundation for you. And so, so everybody has their own mind. Everybody has their own weights of reasons. And I think this is very helpful because I think what happens sometimes is people will say, the argument from contingency or any argument is only successful, it only works if it forces every person to its conclusion. And I actually think that what makes an argument successful is that it helps you as an individual see some new things. Um, e even if the new thing that you see is that you need to have some reason to motivate brute contingency in order for you to you know, think that there is brute contingency. And that's a form of progress personally. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, do you want to say anything? That was or? it. Yeah, no, those, those are just some of my thoughts about um, that because I think sometimes people will kind of lose sight of the value of an argument because they think it only has value if it resolves all possible disagreement and reduces the skeptic to an irrational fool. And all that does is it, it, it motivates rational people to kind of put on more armor and say with a stronger voice, this argument doesn't work. And so everybody's fighting over whether it works. I mean, I actually had a, a YouTube recording a few weeks ago where um, I was, we were talking about this with somebody who would be a skeptic of the conclusion. And, but we talked about how the argument could still work by exposing a reason. And he seemed to agree that the argument does expose a reason. And that's valuable for people to see that and to discover that, uh, even if it doesn't remove all rational debate. So that, I think a lot about that because I think a lot of these arguments the value of the argument is completely lost in a kind of tribal warfare. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can get past that, we can sort of recognize, oh, you can be rational and not accept the conclusion. Then it slows down things. People start thinking more carefully about the argument and the particular premises and they can see, oh, okay, I can see how this actually does help. This, there's value here. This does expose a reason, not necessarily a knockdown proof, but it's a powerful reason to think that there's not any kind of brute contingency. So yeah, those are just my thoughts about that. Feel free to comment or 
press back on that? Yeah, um, there's two things. Um, one is, um, I guess, um, going back and then I'll jump back to where we were because uh, this thought came to my head, which is, so when we look at, when we're, when we're, when we're looking for explanations or when we're taking into account the nature of explanation, um, don't we always have to take into account the nature of the thing that we're explaining? Like the reason why we think that contingent things need to be explained is because the very nature calls for an explanation. And so we are in some way, aren't we, aren't we basically saying because of the nature of this, of X, it has an explanation. So we're actually saying we're actually using explanation in terms of its nature. And so if we have a necessary existing thing, then we can literally do the same thing there and say the explanation of it uh, going off of the fact that we are taking into account its nature would be the necessity of its, of its mm -hmm. existence mm -hmm. because it has necessary existence. Like I, I see that. Like, do you, do you follow with what I'm saying? Yeah, no. And I'm sympathetic with that. Uh, I, yeah. I think part of it is that there are different notions of explanation. So I think there is a kind of explanation from the nature of the thing. Um, and that, that, that seems right. Yeah. Okay. And that goes perfectly into my second question, which is, um, what is, I guess, if we ask the fundamental question, like, what is explanation? Like, what is the nature of explanation? Like, how would you go about kind of thinking about that? Um, yeah, this is something, something I've been thinking a lot about, and even recently just thinking more about it. And um, kind of on a basic level, I think of explanations as illuminators. Um, they illuminate. And so you can have an explanation that illuminates to different degrees and in different ways. You know, so maybe, you know, what you were saying just a moment ago about the nature of a thing, providing a kind of explanation, maybe there's a kind of illumination from nature. Maybe that you can have grounding explanations that illuminate as grounds, causal explanations. Um, I think that even probabilistic connections, I've been thinking about this very recently, that maybe conditional probabilities are actually about explanations to degrees. So, um, you know, something is probable, it's like, it's, you know, 50% uh, probable that the, if, if you toss the quarter, it'll come up heads, you know, so it's 50% on the condition that the quarter is tossed, that'll come up heads. It's like, well, is that sort of conditional probability, a kind of degree of explanation? Maybe. Um, mm -hmm. so, and I think it's, it's actually kind of helpful when you think about the argument from contingency to really leave open the kind of explanation you're looking for because you don't really need to have that worked out. All you really need is that there's some link, something external to think that's being explained. I mean, that would be sort of your minimal condition. It's not a circular explanation. You know, the, the blue sphere doesn't explain its own existence. It, there's something external to it. Um, you know, and, and, and the reason that external is because that's precisely the kind of reasoning that we use in science when we're looking for explanations of our observations. And it's like, why do we make those observations? You don't just say those observations, there's something else, something else that illuminates them. And then we can sort of leave open whether the illumination is causal, uh, grounding, what it is, you sort of leave that completely open. But as long as it's external and the thing you're explaining is all the contingent things, the explainer is gonna be non-contingent and that's all you need. So okay. That's how I think about it. I, I like that a lot. That actually helps helps my thinking. Okay. Yeah, and I think it helps us to avoid kind of unnecessary debates. Um, I mean, when I say unnecessary, I mean unnecessary for the purposes of the contingency argument. Of course, there's a whole literature on grounding, a whole literature on explanations, you know, and and so in investigating the nature of our explanation is useful in its own right, but it's, it's really better. I mean, this is kind of general advice for building any argument or any pathway to truth is it's better to take the least arduous path to the destination. And a lot of times that means seeing what isn't necessary for the path, even though it's so distracting because it's like so interesting and you want to resolve that, you know, especially like there are people who would say that, um, they, they, they don't have an indeterministic account of quantum mechanics. So they would have more of a, Bo of a Bohmian account where there are hidden variables. And, and actually, once you understand the deep structure of things, it's not indeterministic. And so if somebody says, oh, virtual particles are uncaused because they're indeterministic, it's tempting 
if you believe in a deterministic sequence in the natural order, to respond by defending the deterministic sequence. Um, but you don't need to for the argument. Or another example would be the term cause. So I was having a conversation with somebody, and I said, I think causes can be indeterministic. They were bringing up the virtual particle objection, that virtual particles are not cause. And when I said, I think causes can be indeterministic, they responded by saying they thought it was part of the definition of the word cause, that if it, there's a cause, that it's deterministic. Mm -hmm. See, now at that moment, it's, it's tempting to debate the meaning of the word cause, but that's a temptation worth resisting. <laughs> so yeah. what I said was, okay, that's fine. We can use the term cause to mean deterministic cause. Uh, let me just use another word, condition. Do you think there can be indeterministic condi prior conditions? You know? So he was happy with that. And so we then moved forward in the conversation. And the way we were able to move forward was just not getting distracted with what's sort of an unnecessary detail. It doesn't matter if it's a cause, if it's a ground, if it's a condition, just that it's something that provides some illumination to some degree. It doesn't even have to be sufficient illumination, you know, because people use that principle of sufficient reason. And then there are certain objections like modal collapse, you know, based on the interpretation of the meaning of sufficient. It's like, okay, well, fair enough, but it's actually not necessary for the argument. We can have just some explanation, even some minimal explanation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of sort of general advice for making arguments and carving paths to new places is really to avoid those distracting weeds. Like they're interesting weeds, but like just gotta avoid them. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, let's see. So when we're, I guess, what is, what principles of explanation do you choose to go with? Mm -hmm. Um, like, do you stick with, you know, either, you know, from, you know, we have both extremes, the strongest form of the PSR to, you know, something that leaves room open for anything for some type of possible explanation, maybe in multiple you know, maybe it's in multiple things, not just one thing or something. Yeah. Kind of where I'm do you... Glad you're asking this question yeah. because I think people think that there's a kind of competition between principles. And actually, if a strong principle successfully entails a weaker principle, if the weaker principle is true, that means the stronger principle has predictive success, which is actually evidence for the stronger principle. In other words, true principles that are weaker are evidence for stronger principles. Um, so it's not actually a competition. In fact, there's a kind of mutual reinforcement there. Um, and so, and I, I like to kind of point people to just a variety of principles. You know, they, they, if they have objections to ones that are too strong, let's go to a weaker one, right? Now, let me just tell you this. I wish that the simplest principle were true. You know, the simplest principle is that everything were thing, I mean that individuals and plurals, all realities, big and small, individual or plural, has some kind of uh, external cause, uh, right? But, but that can't be true because reality in total doesn't have an external cause. <laughs> there's nothing outside everything, right? Um, so already I have to recognize that there's some reality, namely the totality that has no external cause. And now I'm wondering, okay, how do I restrict my principle of causation? And so then that leads us into um, an argument from causes of contingent things or causes of limited things or explanations of contingent things, non-deterministic explanations. Right? So there's a cluster of principles. And, and like I said, I don't think that they're really in competition with each other. I think there are many, many truths here, uh, many paths to truth, many bright lights. And for the purposes of like conversation with somebody, I kind of like to find out like, what do they think is true? Like, do they think science can successfully make inferences? Like a lot of people would say that that's true, right? And then we can, we can go from there. It's like, okay, science can successfully make inferences. Let's talk about how that works. Is it inference to the best explanations? And is it an explanation of observations? Great, you know, so um, now we can use this principle, inference to the best, and then we can run the argument in terms of that. Okay, so what's interesting fact, about I'm that? I'm sorry to interrupt you. If I could just like hammer this down. Like, yeah. I actually have an article where I start from the skeptic's interest in truth. And I make the argument that the very interest in truth seeking, it actually presupposes that explanation, uh, that, that explanations, explanation seeking in the relevant domains is rational, or at least 
possibly successful and that that's all we need to run an argument from contingency. So I, I have that um, somewhere, but so, yeah. So there are different pathways. Wow. It's really yeah. helpful to start, I think, with, with the person that you're talking with. If you're talking with, you know, talk, start with their resources, start with their ingredients, not to trap them, right? But to explore with them, see what, see if they already have enough in their own resources to get there, rather than starting with your own favorite principle, um, which may not be as helpful. So continue. I'm I'm sorry I, I interrupted you. No, that is really good. I uh, that was a, I need to chew on that. Um, okay. So what's interesting is I like where you went. You said okay. You know, well let let let's look at you know how science works and things like that. Having successful predictions and things, and you can go down that route. Um, I tend to find that that my only drawback. And going that route is you tend to run into people who are 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 hard empiricists mm -hmm. and, and and that's kind of the philosophy that they're coming from so like how i see it as well i can only get good so far with that part. i spend a lot of time trying to kind of liberate people from having to stick to this just part of this kind of view mm -hmm. evidence in things i don't i don't I, I feel like that limits like unnecessary limits unnecessarily exactly. limits you yeah and so yes. i feel like if i'm talking to someone and when we go down you know the scientific methodology route in terms of taking those main components and, and elements to 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 finding uh the relationships between explanations and causes and effects i feel like they would only they would only stick to what they could can verify through the senses. I feel like they would want to only stay there. Yeah. Even if oh, the I just have to evidence is you know. Yes. What? That's a really, really important worry. I mean, one of the things I, I try to do is I try to show that in order to use empirical inferences, you actually have to rely on probabilistic principles that are themselves not empirical. So like in order to do the game of scientific inference, uh, to, even to do science, we need principles of reason. And so, um, but I mean, th this is one of these things where there is a certain kind of tension here. And I think it takes wisdom to navigate that because you're absolutely right. And, you know, people will limit themselves to a certain set of tools. And, you know, one thing you can do is like work with their tools, but you don't want to reinforce the sort of limiting the box that says these are the only tools you can work with, you know? And I mean, I guess it's kind of a little bit my personality to see what I can do with somebody else's tools. And one of the things I, I like to do is actually show using their own tools that those aren't the only tools. And so it's like, how do you actually do a scientific inference? Like it, it, for any inference, I mean, take, um, let's say Darwin's theory of um, common ancestry. Okay. Or, or, or just natural selection. It's like, okay, that's a, that's a beautiful theory because it explains a lot of data, but there's infinitely many, theories that explain all the data. They're all empirically equivalent. Um, so how, you, how do you decide between those theories? And if you just cite more data, that's going to be a problem because there's always infinitely many theories that explain all the data, always. Um, or like in kind of a more mundane example, or I don't know if this is mundane, but uh, people look past this example because it's so familiar. It's just like believing that there are other people besides yourself. It's like, well, there's another way of explaining all of your experiences uh, you know, maybe everything's just a hallucination and, or maybe there's just this machine, you know, that produces all your experiences of other people, but there aren't any other people. It's like, okay, well, I mean, this might sound like sort of a philosopher's thing, but like the whole point of this is just to expose that the very inference to the best explanation involves recognizing that some explanations are better than others. And you don't figure that out just through the tools of observation. You have to use reason mm -hmm. and um and i don't know you know if, if again it kind of it just takes wisdom to know if you're if you're in conversation sort of what's the best approach um i like to take the approach where i'm not just the one who has the knowledge for them but like maybe they have knowledge for me and so it's sort of two-way conversation and usually in that two-way conversation i'll just discover that um a lot of what I'm learning is kind of which tools they're using. And sometimes I'll even discover that even the tools I think that they're not using, they actually are using those tools, but in a different form. And so there's a kind of talking past each other again. Um, so these are things that I, 
Yeah. And these are things that I discover, like when the conversation slows down and it's not a competition and I'm really just there to like learn and explore and see, get some things clearer. And then I discover, Oh, this tool that I wouldn't have called an empirical tool. You know, they're, they're calling it that they're using it. They're just using it by a different name. Um, and that takes yeah. conversational time to explore what people mean by things. Um, but yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying because you're, you're just exactly right. And I feel that tension myself. It's like, okay, do I use your tools or do I point to some other tools I think you're not actually using? And in some cases, it's pretty clear. You're not using these tools. I mean, I've, I could go on. I, I won't go on. But I could tell you many stories of people who it's like they didn't even know there were these other tools. And then once mm -hmm. they're pointed out, it's like, oh, this is actually very empowering. This is very liberating. Mm -hmm. See that you can actually use these other tools to investigate things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is really, that was, that was really good. Especially where I, where I catch on. It's like, it's like, yeah, you know, then, then you can kind of sit with them and, and be like, okay, well let's examine the tool you're using. Yeah. And, and actually the tools you're using actually don't even need to be in this limited form because they actually um, don't even need to be limited in this way. I, I, I see that. I see how you could, you could do that. Yeah. Um, and especially if they don't feel like you're just doing that in order to collect enough resources to now win the, argument yeah you know, they, they can feel that emotionally you know and so then that won't be as helpful but if they feel like yeah you let's just look at your tools let's see what we can do with them let's see what your tools imply maybe the fact that you're actually being able to use these tools implies something about tools and that's something that implies <laughs> about tools is itself not discovered by those tools <laughs> uh directly but it's discovered by this implication relation which you see through the light of reason and then that takes us into the principles of reason, such as the principle of sufficient reason, as an example. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So basically, like, just for absolute explicit confirmation, um, you can start with a principle as simple as um, it is possible that contingent things have explanations. Mm -hmm. And you could still build on top of that and still get to the same conclusion as even a stronger principle. Yeah, yeah, let's just spell out that very quickly. So let's think of types of things. Okay, so there's the type iPhone. And that general type first became instantiated, realized, implemented when the first iPhones became implemented. Okay, so there are other types um, like the iPhone 29,000. Okay, um, that's a more specific type of iPhone, but that specific type has not been implemented at all. Right, so nothing's implemented it. Now we could ask what explains the implementation of types that have been implemented, all right? But let's say that we're not sure that there is an explanation, um, but here's a principle. For any contingently implementable type, okay, there could be an explanation of its being implemented, right? Uh, and that's a very modest principle, then you might be surprised by like what you can do with that principle, but here's something you could do you can apply that principle to the general type being something contingent. So that type has been implemented. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now we can ask, okay, so what explains the implementation of the type being contingent? Well, to avoid circularity, it's not gonna be explained solely in terms of contingent things because contingent things already implement that type. So in order to have an explanation of the, sort of an ultimate explanation of the implementation of that type being contingent, we need something that's not contingent this will give us the possibility of something that is not contingent. And then we use, we employ some of the developments in the logic of possibility, the developments in logic of possibility that have been axiomatized in the last 60, 70 years. And we've got theorems that we can deduce from these, these axioms. And one of the things that we can deduce is that if we're thinking of a possibility such that if X is possible, and why is possible, and the possibilities are symmetric, meaning that uh, if y were actual, x would have still been possible in this. You can think of possible here as like logically possible. Um, if x were actual, actual y would have been possible. And if y were actual, x would have been possible still in the, in the logically possible sense. Um, then from there, we can deduce that if it's possible that there's a necessary thing, a thing that would exist across all possible worlds were it to exist in any, then it would, it would follow that there actually is a necessary thing. 
Uh, that's kind of an abstract thing. Yeah. I mean, that, that you kind of have to look at the details there. And, mm -hmm. But um, but there's this argument basically that if you can show that necessary thing is possible, then yeah. you modal logic takes over. Now you can show that it's actual. So exactly. how do you show that it's possible? You use this principle of possible causes or possible explanations. And that's a, that's a path that it's, in, it's interesting. I mean, I've actually encountered people who've been moved to think that there's a necessary thing on the basis of that path. Um, they've actually told me, you know, they, they're convinced by that when they weren't convinced by a more traditional path from actual explanations. So that tells me it's, it's possible that that path can actually persuade people, even if the other ones don't. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Um, that's cool. That's a cool way to think about it. Um, Miska, did you want to get the questions? What, what's your head? What you're thinking? Well, yeah, I mean, the discussion has been really interesting, you know, <laughs> and, you know, especially when you think about uh, different tools and the principles of sufficient reasons and how they work and how, you know, we can take different paths, you know, especially when we think about the explanation of contingencies. But um, my own personal uh, thought on this issue would be, you know, I don't just uh, take the basic um, idea of principle of sufficient reason, like the Leibnizian argument. I mean, I could uh, go and read a little bit about what Pross says about this thing. But instead, I just uh, uh, explain a little bit how I think this, uh, you know, explanation of the different things works. And so the way I think it is, you know, when you have these uh, different things like ontological arguments and different versions of cosmological arguments, which uses the basic principle, you know, the causal principle and, and you know, actualization of potential and so on. When you take those into account, it helps you pretty much to see uh, how you could use the principle of sufficient reason, for example. Let's let's take, for example, uh, like the idea of model truths, you know, and necessity itself. What actually does, you know, what makes something necessary is really depend, te dependent on uh, the nature of reality, for example let's say is, is you know when we think about god is is god a necessary being and when you think the ontological arguments and and how you know does you know when you go through the maximal idea you know perfect being theology for example you can end up and see that you know god is you know greatest conceivable being for example and and when you comply the uh, uh, Aristotelian thought here, you could end up saying that God, as an an unactualized actualizer, does not have any potential to actualize. And so that would make God like the sort of ground of reality, in a sense. And so you know taking all these uh, different uh, arguments which, you know, philosophers ha have gone through, you know, uh, for example, Alvin Plantinga, uh, Anselm of Canterbury, uh, René Descartes, Leibniz, uh, all these famous philosophers, you know, you end up in the same uh, idea but you know they have some differences you know not all the ontological arguments are the same and not the all contingency arguments are the same but still you know they go with the same principle pretty much and regardless if you take a strong 
a version of principle of sufficient reason, you still end up having this uh, question between contingency and necessity. And so you guys uh, talked about the idea that there could be uh, contingent beings that uh, are not necessary, but they still, ha you know, they just exist without without uh, any special external cause, for example. So, you know, the side question which I would have is, you know, what we mean by contingency in the first place here. So. Maybe we should have started with that, right? <laughs> what do you mean yeah. by that? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, basically what it means is that its existence is contingent if it, it doesn't have a necessary grip on existence, meaning that it could possibly have not been. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, you take a fork, you know, take your favorite fork, if you have a favorite fork, you know, that, that fork doesn't have necessary existence because it could possibly have never existed at all. Um, it, in fact, there was a time when it didn't exist. And so if you think of contingent existence as possible non-existence, then if there's any time at which there is no such fork, then um, it's possible for that fork to not exist, so it's contingent. So you can think of the difference between necessary existence and contingent existence as being the difference between can not be and cannot not be can fail to be versus cannot fail to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing that up. We, we should have probably defined that right at the start. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I mean, uh, just, that just came up to my mind, you know, when, when people, you know, especially the audience uh, might not understand the idea of contingency. Well, especially and, because that term contingent in ordinary language sometimes means dependent. Like that's mm -hmm. what it means. Well, I think that contingency implies dependence where contingency is can not be. I think that actually does. Um, I, th I think there's an argument that whatever is contingent is dependent, but it's not just like part of the internal meaning of the term, um, even though there's another usage of the term that does mean dependence. So that's, that's a point of confusion. The same thing when you talk about necessary beings. Um, I didn't know this until I sort of came out into the popular sphere and talked about arguments for necessary being. And people were like, you didn't show that it was a being. You just showed that it was a something that could produce something. And I was like, yeah, that's what I meant by being. Yeah, that's yeah, what philosophers right. mean. When we say being, we just mean a something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, I mean, if you go to the Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, there's stuff on necessary beings, you know, and they talk about abstract objects as beings. You know, so, so we're a little weird. Philosophers are weird. You know, we don't really use terms in the way most people do. And so that does lead to confusion. So it's good to just clarify. If we're talking about an argument for necessary, that's why now I use the term foundation. You've noticed I've been using that term just because I've discovered it has this kind of unclarity in the popular sphere. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really important to understand. You know, <laughs> being you know you know uh, different fields of sciences you know use the same term, but they mean you know it means a different thing basically. You know, axiom, for example, in mathematics and computer science and uh, philosophy and so forth. You know, they have a little bit differences, but um, um, yeah. Do you guys want to go into questions or should we uh, uh, discuss? I'm cool with questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so, so um, let's see what I have here. So, um, mm, yeah, the first question is, uh, uh, especially for Charles, um, what is your preferred causal principle or PSR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, we kind of talked about how they're different principles, and I think of them as kind of mutually affirming. Um, and, and I like to kind of work with whatever principle the people in my audience like to work with. And different audiences will find different principles more appealing. Uh, 
So, you know, what is my favorite principle? I mean, like, I like true principles. I think there's a lot of different true principles. Uh, for a while, I, I, I liked the principle that, um, the, the argument from types that I gave, you know, any contingent type could be caused to be implemented, something along those lines. Um, but then more recently, I've realized that it's almost like unnecessary to go that modal route. It tends to be kind of abstract for people. And I find it helpful. I mean, the, the principle I give in the chapter with Proust, I think that any contingent things has a causal explanation. That's a very powerful principle. It explains the data. It's simple. I don't know any simpler principle that competes with it, emphasis on competes. Um, so there are other principles that that principle will entail, will predict other principles. And so, and that principle is enough to get you to a necessary foundation. So the principle again is any contingent things, for any contingent things, there's going, there will be some external causal explanation of those contingent things. I like that one. I don't know if it's my favorite, but I like it. I think it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have anything, Tim? You know, is there any? Um, yeah, well, I see, I think I'm still in a phase where I'm still exploring what my favorite is. Um, I, 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 um, I like a lot of them. I mean, I think the PSR is just true, but, you know, there's still debate around that and, and things of that sort. I don't usually go with that. Um, um, I usually like, like the argument I formulated um, went with um, any contingent concrete thing, focusing on concrete reality and things like that that sort um, has an explanation. Um, I just think um, that one as it relates to just scientific exploration, um, I, th I, th I think if we're talking about truth, I think that's true. I think that's what science affirms. Um, and that's what we in science try to do. We, you know, if you look at, and we're just trying to um, turn the relationship between um, cause and effect within nature and things like that. And so if I look at um, any contingent concrete thing, as an explanation. Um, I think, to me, that's really a non-trivial jumping off point. Um, but earlier I brought up like, if uh, uh, it is possible that contingent things have explanations, I think it's also one that's just nice to work with. But um, yeah, I don't really have a favorite, um, but there's some that you know, I can work with, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, if I would answer the question, uh, probably, you know, uh, there is, uh, um, this basic, you know, Leibnizian idea, you know, I, I find it pretty much the, uh, uh, the, uh, good, uh, principle of sufficient reason and, uh, you know, it's it's because you know there is actually you know if you think uh, you know things uh, contingent things and necessary things you know especially the existence of God and previously I brought the uh, Aristotelian ontological argument and so the principle of sufficient reason is all about explaining the not just physical reality but you know, metaphysical concepts as well. And so when I apply the basic idea of PSR, where it says that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either by a necessity of its own nature or something external cause, you know, there might be uh, metaphysical concepts which need some sort of a external cause, you know, not in a physical sense, because if you think, um, let's say, morality, you know, or something else, which is not physical, they need also as well an explanation of their existence, you know, could it be that morality just exists, you know, sure, you know, it needs some sort of ground to begin with, it, it just doesn't exist, you know. You, you know, we don't have any reason to assume that uh, morality would exist 
just without an explanation of its existence. You know, especially when you think naturalistic uh, uh, framework, you know, I don't think you have any, any uh, sufficient explanation for the objective morality or the moral realism. Instead, you know, you end up with concluding that probably there isn't any good way to know moral truths beside something more foundational. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I think that is probably the basic way I would put it. And probably, I just, I, yeah, John, yeah. I'm actually kind of curious what you might think about this. So one of the kind of standard views in the philosophy of morality is that there are these moral principles and that they have a kind of necessity to them. Um, so that they're not just unexplained, they're not brute contingencies, um, but they're not explained in terms of God, really. It's just, it's just like mathematics. There's just this kind of moral landscape. Um, I wonder what you might think about that. I mean, I know we're straying a little bit from the argument from contingency, but this is relevant to thinking about what explanations are, how they work. I mean, would you sort of say that the necessity is enough to explain the necessary moral principles or would you say that there's going to be a kind of deeper explanation beyond their necessity yeah yeah if i understood you right i would say that uh you know in order to even conclude that there exists necessary necessary principles in morality mm -hmm. it would first of all it would have to be grounded in something because you know, if 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 you don't, uh, let's say you uh, starting with a sort of a agnostic position, for example, you would end up uh, saying uh, like if if there exists you know explanation for physical things, why not for metaphysical uh, things like uh, why there exists the concepts in general why do we have concepts and i think some concepts are you know rooted in this fund fundamental reality of course like the logic itself you know mm -hmm. pretty much we could say it's it's necessary thing or or it has to exist in order to <laughs> proceed in this discussions and you know you know, because it's like uh, describing order and what is possible and so on forth. Yeah. And so without logic, you could, I, I think you could not have any, anything at all. In a sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, that's very well put. Um, and I think it's also helpful to distinguish between our concepts and then the reality that our concepts are grasping onto. So it's like you can have a concept of logical laws and I can have a concept of those same laws, but the laws aren't just like in your head. Like if your head goes, logic goes, right? So logic kind of transcends our heads and then they're part of the sort of the fabric of the, the necessary realm. Um, the reason I was asking about the explanation of the necessary realm, whether it's moral or logical or whatever it is, is because I actually do think that um, necessity maybe removes sort of one call for explanation. It sort of removes the call from contingency for an explanation of why it is rather than not, or just, you know, why, why it has that existence. But um, it does seem to me, and I, and I really think a lot about this, that even within the realm of the necessary, it's, here, here's a way of thinking about this. Like, so imagine that there is a sort of necessary abstract realm, including within mathematics. And imagine that like all the numbers exist except for the number 17. There's like a hole in the abstract landscape. That'd be really weird if there was that hole there. Like we wouldn't expect that, right? And I think the reason for that is because this, the, the mathematical landscape itself isn't just arbitrary. There's a, it's rooted in something like more basic, like some basic non-arbitrary principles. And so, I mean, this would be 
taking us into a kind of stage two of the contingency argument. Stage one being an argument for a necessary foundation, then stage two being an argument from the necessary foundation to its supreme nature. And, and I like how you brought up morality there because it kind of fits in here when you think of all of the things that exist in reality, moral principles, mathematical principles. And if you think of these things as necessary, because some, some naturalistic philosophers will say, well, they're necessary, therefore there's no further explanation. Well, if they're necessary, then if you let N stand for the totality of all necessary reality, then these things are in a sense part of N, right? Okay, so now we can ask, well, well what else can we say about N? Does it have a more fundamental nature that explains why it has a moral dimension, a, a dimension of perfect principles of reason? You know, that's sort of like striking, like why does reality contain that, right? Um, and so I, I'm happy you brought this up because I think this actually points us to a reason to think that fundamental reality isn't just necessary, but it has a kind of supreme nature that unifies all the necessities within it, including the necessary principles of how to reason properly, uh, the necessary principles of how to live properly, right? Like these are just the kinds of things that would be predicted by a necessary supreme nature. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And that, I guess this is the reason why I brought up ontological argument mm -hmm. and other versions of cosmological arguments in the first place, because th th those all are rooted in the same, you know, question, the nature mm -hmm. of reality and what nature of reality contains. And so, you know, if nature of reality contains, let's say, uh, a, be a being which nothing greater, greater can cannot be conceived then mm. it's that's it i mean uh, pretty much if if cosmo you know uh, ontological argument works logically and follows deductively you know that therefore we can conclude that the fundamental nature of reality is actually a god you know mm -hmm. uh, and i don't see you know I don't think we need any other, uh, you know, explanation of that uh, explanation of reality, you know, because mm -hmm. that's it, you know, uh, because, you know, we don't have anything else than deductive reasoning and logic and so forth, where we actually can know things that exist. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, because if we would not have these, and there would be another more fundamental method than you know these all the you know discussions in philosophy and science would be you know in question you know they wouldn't be the fundamental or more fundamental in in that sense and so that is why you know i think uh, uh that when you go enough deep in this these uh, discussions you sort of uh, realize that the uh, for example neoplatonistic idea of reality or Thomistic idea of reality or something else is is you know probably necessary in order to fully explain uh, the nature of reality so yeah uh, before I we go into the next questions, do you have anything to add? I'm good for now. Yeah, Tim, are you good? Um, let me think. Um, yeah, I guess just real quick. Um, yeah, if I were to see, okay, you know, you have these uh, necessary principles of morality, it makes me think, okay, you know, it seems like we're talking about in terms of like platonic entities okay we have uh these things called justice and we have these things called uh, okay necessarily exists but there's a difference in necessity in terms of what we're talking about with like god's necessity in terms of well he's the found foundation right versus the necessity of a principle which is it has to exist but you know it's not grounding reality it's a part of reality that's necessary mm -hmm. and so a a deeper foundation necessary foundation of reality i would that's where i would go to in terms of the explanation um 
it, its existence is, ex, is explained in terms of its necessity, but mm. why that type of existence, you know, as a principle rather than a foundation. That's the first thing that I think of. Mm. And whether or not you, it depends on your view of abstract objects, I guess, at that point. Like, would you be a Platonist? Would you be anti realist, conceptualist? But, you know, just but mm. that's kind of where I would first start. Yeah, that's good. And I think it's just helpful to see how a foundation of reality can anchor all of these things together. It can really anchor your ontology. I mean, right, so maybe you have abstracta in your ontology. Well, why, why, are, there, why are there any abstracta? You say, well, they're necessary. Okay, well, great, then they're part of the realm of the necessity. And so you have this realm of the necessity, Then I like how you put it, Tim, that we're talking about not just a necessary realm, but a necessary realm that can be concrete and can anchor everything else. And so, so kind of my, my view that's emerged over the years is that there's this necessary concrete realm that has a nature and that its nature is um, sort of a house for all the things in Plato's heaven, um, if there are any things in Plato's heaven. So whatever's in Plato's heaven is part of the nature of the foundations uh, of the foundation of reality. So that's how you have a way of kind of synthesizing the abstract and the concrete in one ultimate mm. absolute foundation. That's cool. It is cool because it explains so much. It like has so much predictive success. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been thinking about, like, I actually think that one of the things that uh, people could maybe come to an agreement upon is that whether or not God exists, I think we should be able to agree that the print, that the hypothesis that there's a Supreme foundation has enormous predictive success because it predicts the supreme principles of thinking, the, the moral landscape. Uh, it, it predicts that there's a necessary existent foundation. Uh, it predicts a lot of things successfully. It even predicts the powers and principles uh, that are required to produce beings like us. You know, and, and there are beings like us. You know, so there's a successful prediction there. And um, I mean, yeah, I mean, a successful prediction is evidence for the theory. You know, I mean, this is, this is how science works, you know. So um, wholly apart from the argument from contingency, in a way you could think of the argument from contingency, the first part of the argument, the argument for a necessary foundation, as a reason to think that something is true such that theism successfully predicts that thing. And so it's a way of uncovering data that theism successfully predicts. Indeed, indeed. Um, so um, I have uh, actually uh, a couple of questions here. So um, uh, this question would be uh, pretty interesting, you know. So the question is, um, how would you respond to Hume's claim that there could be an infinite regress of explanations? where there would be no ultimate explanation of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is good. So there's actually two different Humean objections here. It's kind of useful to tease these apart. These are both objections from the infinite regress. So one kind of objection says that if you have an infinite regress, then that sort of takes away the need for a further explanation. And then the other objection is that if you have an infinite regress, then the infinity of it provides the explanation. So in the one case, you have no explanation, but you don't need one. And the other is you have an explanation and the infinity provides it. And I find it just really helpful to think of a concrete example to kind of help your mind think about these cases. So let's, let's just use, let's use the turtle example. Okay, so let's say you go outside, you see a turtle hanging and you're like, why is that turtle hanging? And you look up and you say, oh, it's hanging on another turtle. And you look up and that other turtle's hanging on another turtle all the way up to infinity. Okay, um, now, so now let's think about those two Humean objections. So one objection is that because it's infinite all the way up, now that completely satisfies your curiosity, uh, there's no need for a further explanation. I don't think so, because you can still wonder why there are any turtles there at all. The mere number of the turtles doesn't explain why there are any turtles there. It doesn't explain why that whole thing is held up at all. Okay, so, um, and there's ways of being precise about this, but I think just intuitively you can sort of see that. Uh, I mean, one way of getting precise is to focus on the general type being a turtle or the general type being contingent. And that general type is instantiated rather than not 
And the mere infinity of the instances of that type does nothing to explain why the general type is instantiated rather than not. I mean, think about this. There are types that aren't instantiated, like pink unicorns, right? They're not instantiated. Um, and there are possible worlds where there's infinitely many pink unicorns. That entire infinity is not instantiated because there's no explanation of its being instantiated. That's why it's not instantiated. So if it is instantiated, there better be a further explanation of its being instantiated. Okay, so that, that takes me to the second version of Hume's objection, which is maybe the infinity itself provides the explanation. Here, what I want to say is that if there's no external explanation, then what you actually get is a circular explanation. You get it explaining itself. It's explained in terms of its own members. And that's not the kind of explanation we're looking for. I think that's precisely why if you see those turtles hanging up there, if somebody says, oh, you know, you're like, why are there those turtles there? And somebody says, oh, there's the infinity of them explains them. You know, that, that's really no better than saying there just is no explanation. It really just reduces to saying there's no explanation. All reason and experience supports an external explanation. And so without an external explanation of the, of the series, it's, there's still something left unexplained there. Um, so those are some of the things I would say. I mean, there's a lot more to think about here. Alexander Proust has a cannonball example where he addresses this. He, he uses an example where there actually is an infinite chain of causes, but occurs in a finite amount of time because each cause takes like half the time as the one before. Uh, and, and yet there's no sort of cause of the chain. And, uh, and so the cannonball just gets launched without a cause, but there is an infinite chain, but there's no cause of the chain. And then you can't really distinguish that well, you, you can distinguish that from an external cause of the ball. And that distinction is actually importantly, important because an external cause would actually explain why there is that cause, why there, there is that ball rather than not at all. The mere infinity of the chain does nothing to, um, to explain why that ball launches. And so, you know, looking at Proust's example there is also helpful. Again, these are just introductory remarks, but um, I just... Here's maybe a closing statement on this. There are different versions of the argument from contingency. And if there's a version of the argument from contingency that actually has as a premise that the chain of causes has to be finite, then the infinite regress objection will successfully target that argument. Um, but the argument that we've discussed, I mean, there are different versions, but my favorite principle that every contingent things has an external cause isn't even touched by Hume's objection. It's not even touched by it because that principle will imply a necessary foundation for contingent things, no matter how many there are, even if they're causally connected, even if they're linked together by explanation relations. And so Hume's objection just doesn't even apply. It's just a red herring, it's just a distraction. And I think the reason why it comes up is because there are other versions of the argument where it does apply. So we just have to separate the arguments. So I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, it, it helps actually. So, um, Tim, uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, well, I, I wasn't was the question how you how would you respond to this team in objection? Was that the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question was uh, that how would Charles or any one of us respond to the Hume's objection of infinite regress? and that there sh there could be uh you know that there would not be an an ultimate explanation of reality so yeah um um well i think it's interesting because there's like two ways you could go down you could either argue against infinity being applied to reality um which i think there's there's very good arguments for that or you can go down the route that josh went which is okay let's just, let's just grant it and, 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 let, and let's see how good of an explanation it really is. Um, and, and, and Josh, I've messaged, you, I've messaged you before about this, because in my mind one day I was like, wait, but I'm like, but positing infinity is like more of a complex explanation. Like, I feel like it calls out for more of an explanation because, you know, you, something, two, two turtles, you know, a turtle hanging on another turtle, you know, there's an explanation for that. But then when you stack it up infinitely high, it's like, okay, yeah, now that's, now we're good. You know, now, right, now right. That's it's like, why is there that turtle there? Oh, because there's infinitely many. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, <laughs> sorry. You've only made it worse. You've only compounded the mysteries. 
yeah, exactly. And that's where I go. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I just don't think um, in uh, uh, raising the quantity to infinity is really is, is a good way to um, but you see, it's an ultimate explanation. So, because I'm thinking in terms of, okay, well, does infinity make it independent? But I don't even think that's what Hume was even saying, it seems. It just is like, well, infinite regress. Like, that's it, you know, and stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, it, you know, it adds complexity to it. I don't think there's any relevant difference between two things needing to be explained between being, being explained. Um, yeah, you just I mean, you that. might even wonder what explains why the thing has lasted so long. So if there's sort of this infinite sequence, one after the next, after the next, after the next, and if at any moment reality could just vanish because everything's contingent, nothing has necessary existence. So you, so you, you know, in fact, the very fact that it's lasted that long seems to be evidence that there is a necessary foundation. Right. You know, so that, that's another way of thinking about this is like, if there were an infinite regress, this is maybe to echo your point, Tim, is like it actually compounds the reason to think that there's an explanation even of the infinity itself, whether it's sort yeah. of a vertical infinite of turtles or an infinite across time. Uh, it doesn't really make it any less mysterious that there mm -hmm. are things for so long, forever. And, and maybe what's going on is that there's a kind of intuition that if something has necessary existence, then it would have eternal existence. So if something's right. eternal, then maybe in the background is like, it's kind of what you're saying, Tim, like it's explained by its own nature, ultimately. But it's not merely its eterni eternity, it's, e it's eternal because it has a necessary nature. It's eternal precisely because it can't not be. Um, and so instead of de uh, destroying the argument, it actually illuminates the argument. In fact, I've. <laughs> In my book, How Reason Can Lead to God, I have a whole chapter on objections. This is one of them that I discuss and responses. And one of the themes that I discovered as I was thinking through the objections really carefully is that it seems like not only the objections not weaken the argument, every objection in its own way actually strengthens the argument. It puts it into greater light. Um, I mean, even, even like this objection about, I don't know if somebody has this as a question, but like, how does the necessary thing produce a contingent thing? And what's the connection between the necessity and the contingency? Um, how can you get a contingent effect from a necessary cause? You might think the only effect that you could get from a necessary cause is a necessary effect, in which case there's no contingency, you know? And it's like, well, one solution to that is to, is to recognize the possibility of free action, choice, right? That, that actually a way that you get a contingent effect from a, a necessary cause is that the necessary cause chooses on the basis of reasons that effect. Um, and then those reasons actually provide a kind of explanation of its choosing or causing that effect. So not only doesn't that objection, this is kind of an objection for modal collapse, that if the foundation is necessary, everything's necessary. So everything collapses into one category. And my response is that actually not only doesn't that objection destroy the argument, it actually maybe tells us more about the nature of the cause, actually illuminates the argument and illuminates the conclusion of the argument. The cause has this sort of power to produce things spontaneously on the basis of reasons. Not to say that that's the only um, possible response, but just that the objection actually points to more riches in the argument. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, go on, team. Uh, I, I, yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's really good. And I remember reading that. Um, one thing that popped into my head when you're talking, Josh, uncaused, was popped in your head, uncaused. I'm oh just, yeah, 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 exactly. Is it instrument? Yeah. Um, would be like <laughs> popped. Um, would be like okay. So then, couldn't you go down like a modal route and go like, okay, well, we have this infinite regress, but couldn't there be a possible world in which there's not any infinite regress? Like, it's not saying that this needs to be here. Like right. this doesn't need to be the explanation. So because it doesn't need to be, then it's it it, it begs for, like like that's just kind of where I see like oh well, I can yeah, just right. it's still possible. contingent. It's still contingent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look, either it is contingent or it's not. Okay, mm -hmm. either A or not A. If it is contingent, 
then by the causal premise, there needs to be a further explanation of it. Okay, if it's not contingent, well then it's a necessary reality and we're done with the first stage of the argument. There's a necessary reality. And then we can start filling out what's the nature of a necessary reality, can't be arbitrarily limited because arbitrary limits are themselves contingent, call for further explanation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's yeah. why I think it's again, very helpful to separate the arguments because sometimes people, another objection is like, why can't the universe be the necessary thing? And I say, okay, look, if the universe is the necessary thing, then we're done with the first stage of the argument because that means there's a necessary thing. That's the whole point of the first argument is to show that there's this ultimate necessary thing. Not everything's necessary, some things are contingent. So we have our two category theory of reality. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's nice. That, that's a good response, I think. It's just, is the infinite regress necessary? If it's not, then it's contingent, calls for further explanation. Yeah, yeah. Good point. I like that, that's good, that's good. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to add what actually uh, Alexan Alexander Pross uh, tells about this issue, and I think it just confirms the previous points. So uh, he says that Leibnizian arguments, on the other hand, invoke a very general explanatory principle, such as PSR, which is then applied to the cosmos or to some vast cosmic state of affairs, or else a non-local CP, which is causal principle, that can be applied to an infinite chain of, or the universe as a whole. Mm -hmm. In the PSR-based version, the regress problem is typically handled by showing that an infinite chain of causes with no first cause fails to explain why, there, why the whole chain is there. The main challenge for Leibnizian argument here is to argue for an explanatory principle or CP that is A, possible, plausible, B, applicable, applicable to the cosmic state of affairs in question, and C, not so strong as to lead to implausible conclusions such as denial of contingency or free will. And so, he basically says that in this chapter, I shall defend several Leibnizian arguments, which is uh, the first premise is every, every contingent fact has an explanat explanation. And the second premise is there is a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. Three is therefore there is an explanation of this fact for this exp explanation must involve a necessary being and five, this necessary being is God. And so he goes, you know, all the things he explains what PSR is, and he goes to, why should we believe PSR? Well, because it's self-evident. How does it apply to our physical world? And he takes like evolution, for example. Yeah. And, you know, he just goes and exp exp explains everything, you know in physical and metaphysical level. So, yeah. So, you know, there was a good point which Alexander Pross made. You know, it fails to explain why the chain is there in the first place, you know. And if, you know, if you like to think about possible worlds, you know, could, could it be that there it, uh, would not exist an infinite request? Well, then it's not necessary in the first place. Okay, so do you have anything to add, guys? Um, I have a question for Josh. Uh, so just just real quick about that. Um, is, is, is Proust at all interested in doing like any debates or like any like online conversations? Like, like I, I, I can only find like the few videos I see of him on YouTube. I'm just like, I want to hear this guy like, all the time. Uh, you know, philosophers, in graduate school, we had this um, kind of review of our personality types and every single one of us at Notre Dame, everyone had, you know, the, my, I think it's Myers-Briggs where you have like, um, the I or E, we all had N and T. So N is like intuitive and like T was thinking like all of us at hundred percent. Um, and I thought that was sort of interesting. And then there's also kind of a strong I component too, sort of more introverted than extroverted. So, I mean, <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, Proust, he has all these ideas 
like maps upon maps in his mind and he puts them out into his blog, right? Um, but I mean, he's more reticent about the sort of kind of public uh, debate format. Um, that's what I've heard from him. So, so I'm he, not he, sure, you know, how, how to tempt him, how to lure him out into the yeah. public. We have to think, we have to come up with a strategy for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, for real. I, I would just like to even see him just in a simple like interview or discussion or something yeah. like that. Um, just to kind of hear how he would articulate certain things differently um, and whatnot. Because I read his work and stuff. I'm just like, this is crazy. Um, so, and because you know him and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so that, that was just the only thing I want to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And I just want to say, just to kind of add, um, you had the A, B, and the C that Proust was saying that the principal needs to do. It needs to be well supported, but not lead, be too strong. That leads to some of these other problems. And then he gave an example. Every contingent fact has an explanation. And there, notice he didn't say logically sufficient explanation. It was sort of a more moderate, just has an explanation. So it leaves open the indeterministic explanations. And well, Proust and I, in our chapter, we have an even more restricted principle, which is just that any contingent things that exist have an explanation for their existence. And then that's enough to respond to the infinite regress problem for this very reason that you just read, which is that if the infinite regress consists of entirely contingent things, then you don't yet have an explanation of it or them. So an explanation will call for something beyond the, the chain. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, even if you know there as you said you know there are different versions of uh contingency arguments and so this objection might not be a problem but indeed uh open more uh opportunities to explore the uh, nature of cause and so forth mm -hmm. and you know alexander pross you know he fairly explains that the uh uh, Aristotelian proof uh, uh, doesn't even, you know, consider the possibility of infinity mm -hmm. in in the same sense, but it actually argues that infinite regress cannot exist in itself uh, without uh, this unactual actualizer. So, yeah, the Aristotelian proof you kind of can think of two axes of explanation. I think we might have touched on this before, but like you can think of one is kind of um, horizontal across time. And it's like one thing produces another that produces another across time. Then there's a kind of vertical regress, which is like current. And so one form of the Aristotelian argument is that in order for there to be any contingency now, there has to be an ultimate ground of that contingency. And that's true at every time. And so it doesn't matter how old reality is at every moment of reality there's got to be a current ground of contingency and it can't itself be contingent because that would be circular that's like the t falling down the bottomless pit you know you got to have some ultimate anchor right now that has perfectly robust existence to hold up everything and um you know that leads to various questions each of these versions of the arguments kind of invites its own set of objections or clarifying questions and ha has kind of their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, that's kind of why I like the principle that just any contingent things will have an external, uh, have some kind of explanation because it's sort of neutral on theories of time. It's neutral on this distinction between horizontal and vertical regresses. It sort of leaves a lot of that open. And in fact, one of the things that I try to do in my, my book is I try to show how that principle can fit under different systems. And in the book with Proust, we do this as well, as we show how flexible the argument is that, I mean, you could be a modal nihilist, the, uh, no, sorry, a, a mirological nihilist. You think there aren't any holes, every, everything's simple. The argument could still work um, you, because you can give the argument in terms of plurals. Um, you could be a B theorist you, with respect to time, right? So anyway, there's all sorts of different packages of beliefs that people have different theories and the argument's so flexible because it sort of gets rediscovered inside of each of these different packages. 
Um, and that's kind of fascinating to me. It, it kind of points to its robustness, its reliability. I think you can't easily break the argument by changing the frame because the argument sort of shows up again in the different frames. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So any other questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> there is, uh, so uh, you, you actually, Pretty much answered some of the things already, uh, like um, well, <laughs> this question: What does the contingency argument tell us about the nature of a first cause, for example? Uh, that would be an inter interesting to uh, consider as well. What it actually uh tells us about the nature of the first cause yeah that's good so i'm just going to jump right in here so william rowe in his book uh, arguments first edition was 1975 it's got another edition 1997 i think um and that's that's where i learned of this distinction between the two stages of the argument so he takes most of the book to talk about why the foundation of reality would have a necessary existence um and he's gentle in his approach i mean he himself coming in as a theist, trying to trap people into theism or anything like this. I mean, he's famous for arguing against the existence of God from the problem of evil. Um, I think ultimately he was probably just agnostic, but he thought that the cosmological argument could provide a reason to believe in God. Um, first, that there's a necessary thing, but then at the end of the book, he actually unpacks why he, one might think that this necessary foundation would have the various divine perfections, uh, would have a kind of supreme nature. And one of the approaches that I take in my work is to think about arbitrary limits. So for example, um, let's say that the foundation had sort of a limited number, let's say it took the shape of a, of a flower with five petals, okay? Well, you might wonder like why it has exactly five petals. I mean, the very principle of explanation that leads you to think that there's a foundation can be applied to the very nature of that foundation itself. And you might say, well, it's just necessary that it has five. Well, that seems to break with our intuition about what's necessary. It's like, why would the number five be the only necessary? If you think of it, it's like, if it had to have five petals, that means that having five petals is necessarily instantiated. And every other number of petals is only contingently instantiated. And that's bizarre. And I mean, this is where it seems like you need a deeper explanation of its, if it had five petals of necessity, why? Why does it have five petals of necessity? So I, I have this argument that just like you can explain contingent things, you can explain arbitrary limits. You can actually explain the five number of petals in terms of something deeper. And if that's right, then that will take you to something that has no arbitrary limits um, in its basic nature. And so... While it has some abilities to be a foundation of things, but if it doesn't have arbitrary limits in its basic nature, then its very ability isn't arbitrarily limited. So that's going to give it a supreme ability, what you might call omnipotence. Um, it doesn't have any kind of less than supreme ability. And I would also argue that that's going to imply cognitive abilities because cognitive abilities are, would be conceptually included in supreme ability. Um, if it had less than supreme ability, then again, it would have an arbitrary limit that would have further explanation. So this is, this is one pathway for thinking that this ultimate reality would not be arbitrarily limited, would have a supreme power and even a supreme cognitive power. And there's way more that we can say about that, but it's sort of the beginning of the unpacking of why this first cause wouldn't be a flower or a turtle or you know, any kind of arbitrary thing that's just like everything else that has a further explanation. It's going to have to be relevantly different. And to my knowledge, the only thing that is really the deepest explanation of this difference is a supreme nature, because that's just the kind of thing that when you understand, oh, it's supreme, therefore, because it's supreme, it's going to have no arbitrary limits. It's going to have um, a supreme power. It's going to be the ultimate anchor of everything else. That's just the kind of thing that could be the ultimate anchor. Um, and, and so I think it's worth just kind of one more point, if I may, on this. It's worth pointing out the value of going beyond just necessary existence. Because you might think, 
I was having a conversation with Graham Oppie about this. He said, well, as long as it's necessary, then that sort of stops the explanation sequence. And that's even why I was asking you about um, the, the moral landscape. Well, if, how would you reply, you know, if somebody says it's just necessary? And so we've already kind of touched on this. I think that it's pretty obvious that if you look out and you see a star and somebody says, where that star came from? You say, oh, well, that star is just necessary. That's not really the best answer to that question, precisely because the star is not the kind of thing that could be necessary. It's not the kind of thing that sort of is the ultimate explanation of everything else. So I think the ultimate explanation of everything else is necessary, but that's not the only thing that we say about it. We say that it has the kind of nature that allows it to be necessary. And as far as I can tell, a supreme nature without arbitrary limits fits the bill. It's just the right kind of thing. So that's a start. Yeah, yeah, true, true. And you know, just quickly, if I, you know, think the RP's, um, you know, maybe objection, you know, as as we pondered the moral uh, landscape and its necessity, you know, I would answer pretty much, you know, that you know, uh, in order to morality, for example, to be necessary you would have to explain the crown of the morality because without a crown it would not be a necessary uh, thing in reality and it would lack you know that's that's the point of psr here you know it lacks the explanation of its existence in that sense and therefore it cannot be a necessary uh, I mean, thing. you might think the necessity itself is the explanation of its existence but then on the other hand, to echo something Tim was saying, because it's abstract, you might think that necessity is not enough. Like abstract things need to be grounded in something concrete. Maybe then that's what you're saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I would uh, mm -hmm. propose here. Because, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, because... <laughs> I would even say that the necessity implies the crowning in the first place. You know, mm. they, they cannot be separated in this case, you know, because mm. uh, it would be like saying that, you know, morality is necessary. Well, when I ask, why is it necessary? Well, because it's part of this uh, nature of reality. Well, why is it? What? What actually? Why should we think that morality exists in the first place? You know. Yeah. And so but that's it, what. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Just to maybe press a little bit on this, because I think there's a little more clarity that's important here. This is precisely, I think, what some naturalists are going to say about the theists' uh, solution here, right? Because it's like you say, well, God is necessary. Well, why is God necessary? Like we can imagine a world without God. So what grounds God? And if you say something grounds God, well, then you've just contradicted yourself because God, by definition, doesn't have a ground. Um, I think there's a little bit of a worry here that kind of might be symmetrical. And that, that's why I was kind of pressing, like, I don't want to just say that it has to have a ground um, because it's necessary, right? Because, I mean, the necessity was sort of a reason to think it doesn't have a ground. You know what I mean? It, because it's necessary, it doesn't have a ground. So I say, well, what then is the relevant difference here between a supreme foundation and an abstract moral landscape? And maybe uh, one difference is just the abstractness itself, um, abstract to have grounds. Um, and then another difference is just that, well, um, even if it isn't further, even if it doesn't have a further ground, still it fills out the nature of the ground of everything else, if that makes sense. Like, so this is why my theory is that um, all of abstract reality is actually just part of the nature of the foundation. <laughs> so it's actually part of the nature of the ground. So like, this, I want to, this is, for some people, some people watching this, this is going to be an important point. It's going to help you. Because people say, well, does it all have to be grounded? Could it be ungrounded? In my book with Philippe Leon, it's got the best explanation of things. He presses this question. And one of the things that you could say, and, and I'm inclined to perhaps say this um, with some qualification, that perhaps there are things within the nature of the foundation of reality, like mathematical principles and moral landscape, that actually aren't grounded in anything. 
but they fill out the ultimate ground. They're part of why, I mean, they're, they're part of the supreme nature, you know, it, so it's not really in competition here. It actually just fit, it fits very nicely. Um, if you think there are these abstract things, they fill out the, the, the supreme nature of the foundation. I think that's yeah. consistent with everything you're saying. It just kind of draws it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in order to make a distinction, for example, let's say, uh, you know, why, you know, could it be that there exists, you know, a possible world where God would not exist? Well, mm -hmm. this is, uh, I think, precise the point. And I previously brought up the ontological argument. Mm -hmm. And this is why it has a connection with this. Just as, you know, I would say morality in itself would be a, a something which just doesn't have to exist, you know, and so forth and so forth. And when you think God's, God's existence, uh, would it have to be exist? Well, it really depends on what you mean by God and the ontological argument goes through why God as a maximal great being mm -hmm. should exist as a necessary being because mm -hmm. it could not be otherwise. And that's kind of the necessity here, which I would propose and the difference between morality just as an ab abstract concept, because mm -hmm. in naturalistic, uh, natural, naturalistic uh, framework, you don't actually have any, any, I think you don't have any good reason to just uh, propose uh, these abstract concepts as an necessary uh, truth of reality. Instead, you know, you have epistemic problems. How do you know that the, how, how do you even end up by concluding that some moral truth or, or moral claim is actually true objectively, you know? and so forth. And I think uh, in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, for example, uh, Mark Linville uh, goes through this, arguing that if, if the morality is just a product of natural selection, therefore you don't really don't have any uh, true ground for mora morality and you don't have any true knowledge of morality. And so, you know, you end up with the mess actually with this, you know, you could go on and on and you uh, find these new uh, areas which you have to explain and so forth. And so maybe this is the basic idea why I don't think that, you know, morality would just exist necessarily in reality, because mm -hmm. the, you know, the whole debate, which is the fundamental nature of reality depends on these things mm -hmm. you know what is the supreme being or something mm -hmm. which crowns the whole reality and so well, that that when you explain that then you can ask is morality necessary or not mm -hmm. yeah well and there's a difference between the necessity of discovering morality mm -hmm. yes 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 the morality itself i mean you might think god is good and necessarily so right in that sense there's a moral framework built into god of necessity which actually yeah. makes sense of why there would be this abstract moral landscape. I mean, it's because God is necessary. I mean, that totally predicts that successfully. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. That's yeah. my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I have some other questions as well here. Let's see if, if there is anything which we haven't gone through. Um, yeah, uh, David asks, uh, well, we little bit touched this, but David asks, uh, does the contingency argument hold uh, one, if determin determinism is true, and mm -hmm. two, if B theory of time is correct? Yes and yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing to realize is that if determinism is true, it doesn't follow that um, everything is automatically necessary. But if determinism is true and fundamental reality is necessary, then it does look like everything is necessary. Um, but that's not inconsistent with the argument 
that's just to say that um, everything would be necessary. If you think not everything is necessary, then that would be a reason to think that determinism isn't true. Um, especially if the contingency argument leads you to think that there is a necessary cause or explanation of contingent things. As far as the B theory, it's the same thing, right? Um, on the B theory, sort of one form of it is eternalism, where you have this sort of block, static block of time, past, present, and future, just this one block. It all exists, all there. It's like, okay, well, is it contingent? If it is, then there's an external explanation of its existence. If it's not contingent, then it has necessary existence, and we're done with the first stage. And then now we can look at stage two, which involves shaving off arbitrary, uh, arbitrary limits from its fundamental description. I mean, in a way, stage two kind of helps us to sort of see into the nature of the foundation of the block if the block is necessary. Because if the block is necessary, let, let's say it's necessary and deterministic. Let's, let's say we've got B theory and determinism. There's just this necessary block. I mean, I have to say, when I was in high school, senior year, I had this picture in my mind of reality being this sphere, this four dimensional sphere. And, and I was wondering like, is there an outside cause of the sphere? And I was like thinking about that and pondering that, or is it just, that's it, that's all of reality. Um, that was something I was pondering. And then I began reading these books on the arguments from contingency and it helped me to see that, okay, look, even if the sphere somehow has necessary existence, the foundation of the sphere is not gonna have arbitrary limits because if it does, then those will call for further explanation. I mean, explain as much as you can, right? That's the principle that we use in science. And so if you can find a further explanation, then that further explanation will be more probable than no, expl uh, than no explanation. This is kind of review a little bit, but I'm trying to show how on the B theory, on determinism, you still have the same argument just showing up in another form. You still get a causal structure where the foundation of reality is not arbitrarily limited, provides an anchor for the rest of reality. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Tim, have you anything to add or, you know, talk about this question? The only, the only thing I would say is that um, when I when I first thought about this, um, I used to think, I was like, oh, dang, yeah, I, I made a mistake by thinking determinism and equals necessity, basically, like mm -hmm. if this phone is determined to exist, then it necessarily exists, but um, yeah, that obviously that doesn't mean the same. That doesn't mean the same thing as as as, as necessity, as Josh was pointing out. It could have been determined to be something completely different. Um, you know, we could have been having a completely different conversation at this time. You know, just things like that. So, I mean, determined doesn't mean that it's necessary. Um, and so everything still plays. I think I remember it was um, cosmic skeptic Alex O'Connor and Cameron Bertuzzi had. A, conversation that's right just on his own argument and they yep. he brought that up and um that's why i first heard the objection actually um but now that we look at it it's like oh i yeah, know that those don't mean the same thing yeah um, and a helpful so, way to go this out like imagine you have a reality where all there are are blue dominoes deterministically knocking other blue dominoes down that's the whole reality okay is that a necessary reality well, of course not because it's not even an actual reality so we know it's not a necessary reality, even though it'd be a deterministic reality. I mean, and so our reality could be completely deterministic and yet it's not a necessary reality that could be a different one. So yep. yeah, that's a really yeah. important distinction. I, I saw that, that debate as well and Cosmic Skeptic brought it up. And uh, yeah, and so we're saying the very things that are helpful to say here. His, he brought it up and it was good. It was, I'm glad he did. It helps to clarify some of these concepts. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, uh, you know, if you think, for example, uh, determinism, like in theology, for example, um, as a Molinist, I would say that, you know, uh, just because, uh, let's say, there would be just a one uh, possible world which would be feasible to God and would be actualized that would not mean that therefore it would be a necessary in that sense it would just mean that you know let's say there there would be in in actuality there would be no other possible world where events happen than this one which would only just mean that you know it's 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 certain you know 
but in in not not in the same sense necessary necessary because it could be otherwise mm -hmm. and so you know that's the distinction i think between certainty and necessity you know mm -hmm. in determinism everything is certain because you know things happen you know by by some cause which has no other way of hap uh, you know there's no other way of happening in in that actual world or a possible world whatsoever and so yeah i don't think you know it affects this uh continuity argument in, yeah. in and itself. there's a sense in which we can even distinguish a form of certainty even from determinism like for example i'm certain that i exist even if my existence wasn't a deterministic consequence of other causes uh, but there's yeah. another sense of certainty which I, I hear what you're saying. So yeah, all these distinctions help really clarify the argument and separate gold from weeds, I guess we should say. Yeah, yeah, true, indeed. And uh, yeah. Um, let's see if there is anything else. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, what does Charles feel is the most form, form, formidable uh, objection to his contingency argument and how does he deal with it? Also, what advantage do they to feel that the contingency argument has over other arguments for God's existence? Mm -hmm. So there is uh, two different questions, but yeah. Those are really good questions. Um, so, I mean, there's different objections. Um, really, all the objections under scrutiny. And I always, like, invite people, like, look closer. Like, look closer because if it's a good objection, like, you want to know that. You don't want to just find an argument, think it's a good argument, and then not look close enough, you know. So, um, in my experience, the arguments under scrutiny just fall apart. Um, or they succeed against a different version of the argument. So they don't really apply to the one in question. Um, I think one of the most interesting objections, perhaps this is the most formidable, um, I think it's an objection that kind of exposes a lot of opportunity for more insight, is this sort of um, William Rowe, uh, Peter Van Wagen objection about the connection between the cause and the effect. We already kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, is the connection between the necessary cause and the contingent effect itself necessary? Well, if it is, then everything's necessary, it looks like. If it's not, then it's contingent, but then it has to be caused. So what? So it, does it cause itself to cause the effect? If it does, then what caused itself to cause itself to cause the effect? And you've got this infinite regress. <laughs> and so you start thinking about the options there and it starts looking like you're in trouble because you don't want this sort of infinite regress of contingent causes, but then to block the regress, it looks like you have to have some contingent link that's just uncaused and that defeats the causal premise that all contingent things have a cause. Uh, so yeah, I'd say probably maybe that's kind of the most interesting objection. And that objection really does help to clarify the argument and, and what's going on. I mean, I already, I think, suggested a solution, which is that if the cause spontaneously or freely produces effect on the basis of reasons, then those reasons provide a non-deterministic non explanation of its free action. So you, there's still an explanation there. Um, and what you have is that Proust talks about this in the article that you were summarizing. He, he goes into this very objection. He talks about how those reasons can then provide a kind of ultimate explanation of every element of that regress, because at each point in the regress, like, well, why do those reasons explain this? And it's like, okay, well, those very reasons themselves explain why those reasons would explain this, because by their very nature. So um, I sort of think of that as a potential infinite regress, where each link in the regress is explained by the very nature of the reasons of the cause. And so this is why I said it's a very interesting objection, because it also helps it, 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 it illuminates more of the nature of the foundation. Well, the foundation has to be the kind of thing that can have an explanation 
not just of contingent things, but of its very um, contingent act to produce contingent things. And so, um, yeah, I don't think it destroys the argument. It just actually helps to illuminate the result of the argument. And as far as the advantages of the contingency argument over other arguments, it's funny. I've been thinking a lot lately that I'm, I don't even think that I think this is the best argument for theism. Like, I actually think the best argument for theism is just the fact that you can think. Like, your very current process of thinking rationally just can't come from non-rational causes. You just can't go from particles smashing each other and the, these are non-rational causes and that makes a rational thought. And you just think about that problem there. And I think that opens up a very powerful argument that reality is foundationally rational, foundationally mind-like. Okay. But that argument from rationality and, and, and from thinking is not one I, that I've you know, published on uh, uh, as much. I'm kind of turning my attention more to it now, but um, as far as the contingency argument, I think one of its great advantages is that it doesn't, it doesn't require that there's a finite chain. Uh, it leaves open infinite regresses. It's very general. We talked about how it, it takes a form in various systems. You can be a B theorist. You can be a determinist. You can think there is free will. You can think there is no free will. You, you can think that there are parts, that there are no parts. It's like in every one of these systems, you can think there are abstract objects. You can be a nominalist, right? Every one of these different metaphysical packages um, is one in which that same argument creeps up in a form within that package. And so I think that would be its great advantage is its great flexibility. Oh, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And uh, I think, you know, the uh, uh, latter question is interesting, you know, because indeed, you know, many people just don't, well, many people, uh, the you know, popular culture, I would say, don't consider thinking as a evidence for God's existence, you know, it's... And thinking but, rationally as well. I mean, not just, there's yeah. thinking, and then there's thinking rationally. It's like, okay, we, we value rational thinking. Well, you know, I mean, one of the big objections to a belief in God is that it seems to be connected to the roots of religion, which are associated with irrational thinking. You know, I think this is actually the noble uh, motivation for a lot of skeptics of theism, and it, it is a noble motivation, is to help us think rationally, right? But then rational thinking itself is something that's amazing that this should ever exist within reality, that reality should ever unfold to produce rational thinking. And, and I mean, and you can't explain this through some kind of principle of natural selection or something, because at best, that just gets you, gets you machines that sort of act in ways that are adaptive. It doesn't get you actual thinking, let alone rational thinking. And anyway, I, we could talk about that for a long time, but that's not the, our point here. It's just one of those things that's familiar. Rational thinking is familiar, but we sort of take it for granted, and we don't often think about how there can even be thinking in the first place. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean... This is another topic which which we could pretty much uh, you yeah, know, and separate. There could be thinking just from non-thinking, you know, non-rationality. So I have this picture of like this branch that's sort of randomly moved in the wind to carve meaningful sentences. It's like those meaningful sentences are ra non-rationally based. So they're not reliable, you know. And so if you've got just these things that are not rationally based, but even if you could get rational thinking from non-rational thinking. It's not what you would expect. Whereas by the argument from contingency, now that second stage that gets you a supreme foundation, now you have those probabilistic resources to expect the world to unfold in a way where there are agents that are able to think and discern even abstract principles that are built into the fabric of the foundation. It's like you can actually think about the principles of reason in the fabric of the foundation precisely because that same fabric has the powers to produce, to intentionally produce beings like us who can think. So there's the in principle problem and then there's the probabilistic problem, which the second stage of the contingency argument gives you resources to solve both of those problems. So that's all I have. I've, I've said probably more than I, I should, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're afraid to, yeah, yeah, no problem. You know, it's it's good that you uh, 
uh, unpack these all different objections and so forth. And I, I mean, that's that's really you know um, essential when you think like uh, considering the contingency argument and causes and so forth. You know, like um, what what it would require actually uh, that uh, uh, this non-rational uh, uh, being, which is in this case uh, molecules in our brain chemistry and cells uh, containing a lots, of, lots and lots of information from DNA and epigenetical information layers. Uh, so how this would actually uh, produce uh, conscious experiences and rational thinking, which is, I think, just there <laughs> there is no connection in a sense. I mean, there's no reason to think that uh, uh, molecules actually produce anything like that. And or even if there is a connection, the mm. problem gets pushed deeper down. You mentioned information in the DNA. It's like, right. Information. You know, people talk about laws. There's a law like, well, what's a law, right? I mean, it's propositional. It's thought like, you know, it's like, yeah, you can maybe explain these things if you push the mystery deeper down. And that's what you should do. You should push it all the way down to the fabric of the foundation. You know, mind is there. The information yeah. is there. It's actually in the, you know, scientists bump into this when they talk about quantum mechanics and energy fields. They say it's actually informational all the way down. It's like, yeah, that's right. It is. Good job. You know, you're discovering the, the, this, this fabric uh, <laughs> from another yeah. angle. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I, I just say that here just because I think a lot of times people say, oh, we can explain the mystery through these explanations. Like, well, what you've done is you've just relocated the, the mystery into another form. Indeed, indeed. As and you I, should, because it is ultimately at the foundation, I think. Yeah, yeah I, indeed, indeed. And uh, I think, uh, for example, inspiring philosophy goes these through in his uh, YouTube channel. And so uh, a lot of people, you know, they like this idea. And I think this is another way to conform the idealistic nature of reality in this sense. Or, you know, it could be a substance dualism, but anyways, you know, both require something more fundamental than the, uh, physical nature of reality mm -hmm. the fundamental itself. mentality yeah 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 so i mean well, yeah probably or maybe in the future we can unpack this uh topic more mm -hmm. depending on how how things go in the future but but you know uh, i don't think we have any let's see um yeah Probably we don't have anything else here. We pretty much unpacked all the essential yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, guys, do you have any uh, last words for this uh, discussion? Um, Josh, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so what is Graham Oppie's favorite? theory of I guess what what for him would be the foundation or or, or, or of reality or something what would, I've heard him talk but I've never been able to pin down like but he leaves a lot open right yeah. so I think he he sort of sees it as the kind of object that physicists are best positioned to tell us about and so I think he might have some anticipations that uh, I mean our last conversation seemed like he was sort of warm to the idea that there's an advantage in shaving off arbitrary limits. Um, but ultimately he's going to think of this as a spatial temporal object um, and kind of leave open sort of the details of its nature and, and it's going to wait for the physicists to tell us the best theory of it. Um, so, I mean, what I actually kind of like about this is that we have a lot that we agree on. So we agree that there's initial fundamental layer of reality, that it has a necessity to it. I think we agree to the advantage of shaving off arbitrary limits as far as we can. We agree to the advantage of 
um, eliminating brute contingency as far as we can. And um, so I feel like there's fertile ground there for more progress. And he's just leaving open things that I would fill in with the moral landscape or the logical landscape. Um, and so, yeah, that that's pretty much it. Okay. I mean, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like that type of, yeah. Okay. That's cool to know. That's yeah. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, I think it's easy for people to sort of see people as sort of in this contest where it's like, Oh, you're way over here and you're way over here. You have the, your beliefs are so far apart. And then what they don't see is kind of behind the meadow there's actually a lot of overlap and ground for progress um, there. And so I think it is helpful to kind of point to the common ground there. Um, but yeah, as far as my, my final words, just want to thank you guys. Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, what you're doing is awesome and glad I could be part of it. And, and I, I think just for anybody who's sort of thinking about these things um, from any perspective, you know, people come from different perspectives and sometimes I think, you can almost feel just a little bit lost. Like these are big concepts, smart people disagree, you know, how can you really know any of these things? And um, I want to just kind of affirm people on their journey and just say, you know, um, these are important questions. They are big questions and intellectual humility is a virtue. And you're going to go so far in understanding things just by carrying that virtue of intellectual humility. You know like I've got more to learn and there's there's this interesting thing where you might there's kind of a tension because you might think if you're humble then you're going to remain skeptical um whereas if you're sort of confident you lean into to something you're like confident then you're going to have real knowledge but I actually have found that humility actually is the path to more and more clarity and that you can actually have clarity I would call it a kind of personal clarity as you investigate, even while other people are still unsure or there are some things that you're unsure about, but then there are other things you're starting to get more sure about. And so I want to kind of end in that note, because this is a note about how to be powerful in your own search. And I think that intellectual humility is a key to being powerful in your own search. I think people underestimate that key because they associate it with not knowing or with skepticism. Um, but I think that actually you can use that and you can sort of lean into that and you can follow the light that makes most sense to you. I think sometimes people limit themselves. They limit their powers because they're sort of waiting for other people to figure it out or which team, you know, is the best team to be on. You know, it's like, well, the team atheist, you know, well, we stand for intellectual uh, virtues, you know, so that's the team, you know, it's like, well, but if you wait for the teams to figure it out, you know, you'll be lost forever because we're just <laughs> those teams are always like debating things, right? But you can figure out things, you know, and, and I want to just affirm that. And I want to affirm that like no matter where you're at in your, in your journey, no matter what you think is true, like trust that inner light of reason. I mean, the inner light of reason will lead you to truth. And I have a certain confidence when I say that because I believe the inner light of reason is a voice of God, to be honest. You know, we can misinterpret God's voice, but it's part of the fabric of the foundation of reality, the inner light of reason. Um, so I, I feel very confident in, in affirming people to sort of follow that light and, and let it lead them. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. The humility is, is really important. I mean, I have observed it, you know, <laughs> well, when I think my, my, you know, uh, ways, how I have gone through point a to b and c and so forth you know i have never had this uh, like pride i would say you know in things i i have had you know always this uh need for uh explanation for reality and you know mm -hmm. that's that's the really the fundamental reason why i uh, in got interested in uh more deeper questions when it comes to God. I think the question of the existence of God is the most important question what you can ask. Like William Lane Craig says, you know, I, I think he is correct with the uh, uh, claim that, you know, that is probably one of the uh, most essential or important questions which one can ask, you know, 
does God exist and so forth. And so as we have gone through, you know, I, I think um, people have to uh, really, you know, go maybe slowly these things through or maybe they uh, are more faster and they get it more quicker but uh, regardless I mean be be careful how you go through things and be sure to uh, be open-minded in, in this sense which doesn't mean that you just accept everything like oh well I haven't considered this but you know this must be true or something instead you know you what I mean by open-minded is, is that you know you are honest you know when considering different ideas and you know that's that's why you know you can know some things to be true and false and uh, the last things last thing which i would say in in humility is that when <laughs> well if anyone reads the black hole companion true uh, it doesn't leave anyone cold but they will become these no uh, okay i'm just kidding but you know that well that just tells how how i think the uh blackwell companion for example is a great book for those who are more advantaged in this field and i think you can of course you can question and have doubts about those arguments but uh you just have to be, uh, you know, careful. And if you can contact those philosophers, you can ask questions and have discussions. Like, for example, we have Josh here. You know, he's a, you know, great example. You know, we can actually have discussion with the philosopher. You know, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, do you have Tim anything to say? Oh, just um, subscribe to my to all of our YouTube channels um, and everything, minds evoking theism and things. And that's, that, that's pretty much, you guys covered pretty much everything. Um, that's all I have to say, really. Awesome, awesome, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, audience, go subscribe to Invoking Theism. Uh, yeah, and I don't feel bad if you subscribe to me as well. <laughs> But yeah, and if Josh has any YouTube channel, go and check. Worldview Design is mine. Worldview Design. Oh yeah, yeah, indeed. Go and look the content and and really consider. I mean, yeah. Uh, so um, thank you for watching, and uh, I hope you uh, survived this true and had a lot of thoughts and maybe more questions to us. And so uh, if you have any questions, you can ask for me or Josh or uh, Tim. If you don't have, that's good enough. I hope you, I hope you, uh, that this helps you. Yeah. So see you next time.